Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Good morning, welcome to Lima Lime Bible Studies. My name is Paul Stringini. We are continuing in the book of Hosea. We are in chapter 10. Let's continue in this, uh, the judgments, you could say. And the explanation of the judgments. So verse 1, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. So, he's an empty vine. He brings forth fruit to himself. You know, there's no... What it means is like that there was fruit, but there's nothing there for anyone to gather. You know, um, I suppose, you know, if you want to get literal, it's like all the fruit fell off and fed the vine itself. And that's it's just a self-feeding thing. He doesn't bring forth fruit to God, but only to himself. It's a self-serving circle. And so, because he has been very fruitful, according to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Right, so with the issue of idolatry, um, you know, I think about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. For some reason there's a lot of flies this morning. Uh, concerning when he talked about, you know, you've heard that it was said of old time, thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, you know, and then he gave some stricter interpretation of that idea. Not, not the idea so much as, you know, of the, um, I don't know what word I would use for it, but sort of the family of sins that, Murder doesn't just exist in a vacuum by itself. It's like murder's a sin. And, you know, these other things are not. <clears throat> but he says, no, you you are in danger of judgment when you so much as... Um, what, what, what is the word I prefer to use? I don't know. I'm in trouble with words this morning. Despise your brother, I guess. Uh, degrade, um, you know. But call it, you know, use, using names on your brother to dismiss him and to diminish him, you know what I mean, is uh, also in the same category. So, you know, he said the same thing about adultery. He said he, he got eloquent about forswearing yourself, you know, and he said, don't swear at all. Let your words, every word be true, not just the ones you swear on. And it's important, I think, because it's so easy to just look at some Old Testament things and say, yeah, they were in idolatry, but that's not a problem anymore. There is a root sin of idolatry that uh, we also have to pay attention to and look out for. Because uh, it, just like in the other cases, you know, adultery is obvious it's easy to avoid at least if you're if you're looking out for it you know if you have a mind not to you know you can see its borders 
Well, somewhat, right? And, but then the idea of like to even look that that would be a sin to look with lust, right? Not merely to see with the eyes, because then it's impo you'd have to blind yourself. And Jesus even recommends that. <laughs> so if if that causes you to stumble, what I would say is that your eye isn't making you stumble, you know, and neither is your hand making you steal. But if it were possible to cure yourself of sin by merely cutting off those members, then it would be good for you. That's what he's saying. He's not saying you actually need to go out and do it because the truth is you'll find it doesn't solve the problem. Though it might shock you so deeply that you would change yourself. But anyways, uh, so idolatry also is like, what is the root of an idolatry? Well, they made images and they bowed themselves down to them, not just merely as a external act but there is an inward uh thing going on is that they are honoring the gods they well, how do you honor the gods how do you bow to the gods you know it's like well moloch wants a sacrifice so you provide the sacrifice that moloch wants and this god over here wants a sacrifice so they're in some way giving of their you know and, and it, it ties their fruitfulness here to the altar according to the multitude of his fruit you know he hath increased the altars it's like well we're fruitful we don't want that to stop so we better thank everyone responsible and though they're you know the lord was their god but they looked to the gods of the people round about them saying we should you know honor them also lest they be angry with us and our God be unable to protect us, or whatever. You know, that, that I'm just giving you the kind of mentality. And in similar fashion, you know, when we look... When we look elsewhere for that which we should only find in God, that thing is functionally an idol to us. And it's functioning in the capacity of God. It's functioning in the, cap in the capacity of a man-made graven image you know i mean i i've i've often said things like you know like my retirement plan right but again it's it's more subtle you know what i mean than when it like the cut and dry of thou shalt not kill when you're talking about things like planning for the future or having a vision of the future Having an image, you know, like I maybe I imagine in my mind, you know, if, if, if lust in your heart is adultery or can be, then what about what about the imaginations of my heart concerning you know my future? You know, I could look to God and what God's going to do in my life, or I could look to myself and what I'm going to do for myself. What will I do for myself that my future? is assured now it doesn't mean you shouldn't plan for the future but if we rely on that we have to realize it's like all the best laid plans of men go astray and we can't truly count on it if we're if we're deriving peace from our sense of trust in the plans we've laid for the future we're just as likely to be disappointed as we are to be uh, rewarded. You know what I mean, like you can't rely on the future you create in your mind. You can't rely on the idealism that that is that sprouts from your own uh, heart. And I think ideology. You know, I don't know if the words are even related to each other, but ideology and idol sure sound alike you know they talk about ideological possession men are possessed of ideologies you know which are you know how do you explain it well it's an idea that captivates their mind about how things ought to be or what you know what right looks like in some often in a very narrow uh, at a very narrow level of analysis, like some political ideology, it may just 
run along a certain thing because there's little in the human, you know, and we can't encompass everything with our ideas often, right? We, so that's why they had many gods very often because it's like it was the the thing the, the you couldn't really encompass everything in one god not with the human mind but god is one and so what in you know with our god we understand that we don't know him you know that i think that's one of the fundamental differences is an idol is sort of like saying i know this god let me show you what he looks like let me show you what he and this is what he demands. And it, in some ways, it's more tempting. The temptation is because of the simplicity and the fact that it can be understood, readily understood. Like the mysterious nature of God where it has to be revealed to us or in some ways we have to accept not knowing some things. For some people, it's too much to, you know, like they can't walk in... And, and maintain the balance necessary to be able to um, adhere to something that they can't fully lay their hands on. You know, when, when God appeared to Moses, he took no form. When he appeared to the Israelites on the mountain, he did not take He, he spoke to them from a burning bush, but it was never ever asserted that the burning bush was the form of God. And uh, when he appeared on the mount on Mount Sinai to give the law, it's very clear when he spoke to the Israelites, he said, you saw no form or image. He didn't give them an image, a form, that they could know God by this form, and thereby give him shape and form, and then look to the idol and, you know, you almost wonder, like, well, if I have the proper form of God, what's it matter? And maybe it doesn't. You know, maybe on some level, if you really know what God looks like. But God does not want his worship through an idol. And it is not about his appearing, his appearance, meaning his, his visage, any more than it's about sacrifice, because he doesn't desire our sacrifice. And also, he doesn't desire, let's say, let me put this, he doesn't, let me put it this way, he doesn't need our worship. God doesn't need it. It's not like a, a burning need of him, his, that's what I meant by desire. It's not something like, oh, I just need to be worshipped. That's not true. Man needs to worship God because, uh, it's right because he is the because he is superior he is our creator man as i put it to someone i put this to an atheist because i get like i was challenged on this why should we you know isn't it kind of, well, is he a big baby he needs to be worshipped and i'm like that's not the way it goes it's not how it works man needs to worship god the way children need to obey their parents you know what i mean it's not that i i don't need to be obeyed i don't even need to have children you know what I mean? I can just live my life completely without all of that. But if they want, you know, if they want to survive first, and they want to have happy lives, they should listen to me and heed me. And when I tell them to do something, they ought to do it. They ought to, they ought to, that ought to be their instantaneous reaction, is to obey my words. And, and that is the most effectual uh, kind of worship because worship means to bow the head that is the essential root meaning of the idea it means to bow and bowing means to assent to the authority to the will of someone greater and when they bow themselves before idols they're bowing themselves to nothing or as Paul says or to demons they might as well be bowing to demons you know what I mean? Because they are not God. So you create an idol out of your own mind. You don't create a demon, but it, a demon comes and inhabits it. Or it comes forth from the, you know, the incomplete nature of man's thoughts and processes. When we create our gods, 
we do create demons and not gods. Meaning, they do not. They are. They harm us more than they help us. They are not things that look out for our best interests, but they devour our resources, waste our time. You know, Israel, I think in this way says he's, he's empty vine. You know, he was supposed to bring forth fruit unto the Lord, acceptable fruit. We as Christians are supposed to bring forth fruit unto Christ. We don't want to be the sort who bring forth fruit only to themselves. You know what I mean? Like, I'm fruitful, but my fruitfulness is only serving me. You know, like I, uh, I think I've made that clear that in your fruitfulness, it's not necessarily, you know, uh, like I can be fruitful in myself. I mean, the vine has to be fruitful itself to bring forth fruit to others. You know what I mean? I use myself as an example. Like I study the Bible, I become knowledgeable, and I can bring forth things and say things that help other people. You know what I mean, that fruit is not merely to me. It is not merely beneficial to me. It is beneficial to people around me. To the that to those that are external to me. Some people's fruit in their life is only just to feed themselves. Their whole life is just a process of them working to feed themselves, laying up for themselves. And idols, in some way, are an expression of that. That's why I talked about the idea of retirement planning. And only in the sense of that you're, if you're looking to that, is like sort of like, that's my salvation. That's the goal of my life, to lay up and then eat up. That, there we go. I accomplished my life. I was born. I worked. And then when I was old, I ate it all up. Mission accomplished. I mean, it's just such an empty life. There's no, I mean, that's just like, I don't know. If I was never born, would it have made a difference? You know? My, I might as well have not brought, I, you know, I made a little a nest of myself, a little pile of stuff for myself, and then I sat there and consumed it. The heart is divided. I don't know. You may think, I, I, I'm inclined not to think of that. I'm like looking at that, I'm like, hmm. I don't think that means what I think it would mean normally. Let's see. Already, I looked it up on Bible Hub. You know, Bible Hub. If I put it in browse internet mode, at least that's what I call it. Here we go we're on Bible Hub, and I looked up. I merely clicked on the word. Look at this. It gave me a quick definition, but then I can click and go right to the full definition. And as I thought, it, it's something different. It means to measure. Like divide in the sense of like measuring. To divide or share. Dividing not in the sense of like he's of like you know, you could say like always well, of two minds, shall I serve God or shall I serve idols? That's one way to think of it. But that's not really what it means in this, because in the context it's quite clear that he's talking about his heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. It's like what was said to um, Belteshazzar in the book of Daniel. Numbered, numbered, weighed, and wanting. The, the idea of division has also this idea of counting. Like, you know, like Let's say I take a pile of money and I start dividing it by literally you know, taking one at a time and counting them out. Or I separate them into groups of ten. You ever done that? 
you have a bunch of pennies and you put them in little stacks at you know you want to count them and you put them in stacks of ten and then you count ten stacks of ten. You divide it to sort it out. What it means is the heart is kind of diced up for examination. If you want to think of it as divided, it you could say it's divided among all the idols. It's been poor, par, parceled out. But in that, you know, in the, in the and it's fine to think of it in terms of divided. But I want you to say it's more of a measurement, more of a measurement. But it means divide. It's like the way I divide my heart among things. You know, you can take the measure of me. You know, the, the what, what, do, how do they parcel out themselves? I put my, everything I put into my retirement. So then I can live at ease. You know what I mean? Nothing wrong, you know, it's, you can have a retirement. You know, and it's fine. I'm just saying somebody who works, like, like I work 100 hours a week. And that is possible. Don't, don't think it is. 120 an hour a week is definitely possible. I remember sometimes someone said that's not possible. It's like, yeah, it's not possible because you're playing video games for 30 hours a week. So, yeah, you're wasting a lot of time. You could be at work. It's nothing at all. Some you know, some people, it's easy. I mean, it's not easy to, to keep. But what I'm saying is people get so caught up in their work. I don't want to get down into the silly part of the conversation. You know, they get so um, caught up in laying up for the future. It's all they work at. They spend all their living at that. Preparing for that future. Right? So, let's say your heart is divided among several gods. You know what I mean? I give myself to Molech and to Bel Peor and to blah blah blah. Or I, 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 who, who do you worship? I worship Zeus, Prometheus. I don't even know if that's the name of a. God. I think that's not quite right. Or is it? Or is he the one who stole the fire from the gods or something? I forget. Or gave the fire of the gods to humans? I forget. I, I, Hespestus, Hera, and Demeter. You know, or whatever. Meaning. The things among which you devote yourself. I like that. That's a great word. Devote. Right? Because we know the devotions of the gods. In fact, in the uh, book of Acts, when Paul went to Mars Hill, he saw all their devotions. In fact, in Christianity, I remember... Uh, I haven't been in a Christian bookstore in many years. I remember visiting these places frequently in my early Christian walk and seeing these devotionals. And wondering what that was all about. Daily devotional. It's like a calendar and it has a verse for you to meditate on and maybe some advice, I guess. I don't know. Right? And the idea is to, to give the Lord a portion of your heart every day. Or a portion, a part of every day to the Lord. You know, I mean, God requires, God wants all of us. We even have songs, take all of me. Or is that a love song? I forget. I mean, sometimes I listen to, when I hear a love song, I'm like, this is only appropriate to be sung to God. Because, you know, it's like two, I'm like, eh. <clears throat> I love a lot. And that song makes me uncomfortable. You know what I mean? I consider myself a devoted husband. But sometimes I hear, I hear the lyrics, I'm like, you don't mean that. You know what I mean? Any, I'll do anything. Betray my God. You know, betray my principles. Uh, you know, there's some things that are higher than the earth. And it's important that we have things that are more important than that because uh, it would, it, uh, it's part of what makes us desirable as human beings is to have... Um, you know, if, uh, if you have high moral standards, it makes you per a person more worth loving someone who's like who has no standards you know I, I will steal from you and betray you and uh, 
you know, and take all, waste all your goods and all your efforts on me will be in vain. That's not a person that's healthy to love. The heart is parceled out among all the things they, their soul lusts after. You know, the gods they worship. I worship, you know, it's, it's like, I gotta have my car. I gotta have my whatever it is. You know, I, 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 I can think of so many things and they in and of themselves are not necessarily bad. Like, like I want to be a great musician, so I'm going to study my music all the time. There is a God of music. I remember I had a friend who um, told me at one point, this was very early in my walk, like the first year, he told me, music is my God and Miles Davis is my Messiah. Which made me laugh, and I think he was surprised at that. I think he thought he was going to be offensive to me. But I, I thought it was funny. I'm like, well, we'll see what they can do for you. Uh, you know, but that's the point, is that, that, yes, it can become your God. You can become a devotee of that thing. And it's almost impossible to become very skilled at anything without devoting it, yourself to it in some, in some fashion. But while well, I would say... Look at idol idolatry is wrong, obviously, and we ought to worship the Lord, and He ought to be the most important thing in our life, and we ought to devote a significant portion of our mental space, our care and attention, to that relationship, and to forming that relationship with God, and to maintaining it, and to being attentive to it. You know, so that we are known of Him, even if we are lacking in our knowledge of him, so that he knows us. I know you, you've been talking to me forever. But, while in and of themselves, they may be harmless, there's a point where our pursuits in life get in the way. And if they're getting in the way of serving God, they may rise to the level of idolatry. But in and of themselves, they're not idolatry. They're having a retirement plan or, or, or whatever. But we can form those things into an idol, even if we don't actually make a physical idol. They knew that was wrong. That was the, the grotesque version. But see, the subtle version, here's the thing with all these sins that I talked about, like in Matthew 5, that Jesus talked about. And he said, you shall not kill, but whoever will be angry with his brother without a cause. This is without a cause, but I, there, are some, there are some versions of the Bible that don't have without a cause there. And my belief is, I am inclined to think that was added. Because whoever is angry, everyone has a cause to be angry with their brother. Like nobody's not, I'm just angry with them. Why? No reason. No reason. Well, we, that, 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 oh, wow, gee, you know, Jesus, why are you really late? Whoever has no reason but it's angry anyways is a sinner. Okay. Then I guess we should add that to all the other ones. Whoever calls his brother a fool without cause, whoever says to his brother, Raka, well, everyone's got a cause. Whoever says F you without a cause, well, there's always a cause. You know what I mean, I don't like that without a cause clause. I don't, I just, it's not in every version of the text. So I question that part. Because, and I used to say in, in my song, I eliminated it. I said, whoever's angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment. Because the fact, yeah, men want it cut and dry. Either you mold an idol or you don't. If you don't have a molten idol, a graven image, it's not a sin. To, to be obsessed with that thing. You know, I mean, to devote yourself to a pursuit at that level is not a sin unless you actually form a little idol to it and bow down and worship that idol physically. That's the cut and dry, black and white version of legalistic righteousness. But I'm telling you, that just like, hey, you know what? It's not that you can never say the word fool. 
Whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger. Meaning, you better be careful how you use that word. It's not the internet of itself saying, the Bible says, whoever does this is a fool. This is a foolish thing. Fool, fool, fool. It's all over the place. What Jesus was saying, in the very least way you degrade your brother, you best be careful. You know, if they had added without a good righteous cause, whoever's angry at his brother and the cause is not a righteous one, and the anger not a measured one. You know what I mean? Because it's so easy to ju- when you have with legalism, it's easy to justify sinful things by saying, "Well, it's technically acceptable. It's legalistically acceptable because I did not violate the letter of the law." But in these things, the letter of the law has been done away. Now we got to deal with the spirit of the idea. What is what is it about idolatry that's wrong? And how am I following after it? It's not such an easy thing to discern. And I don't want anyone to lose any sleep over it as a Christian, but especially as a devoted Christian, if you're not, if you're, if, if someone's just a very nominal Christian, they're probably involved in idolatry on some level of analysis. Certainly they are. They probably are. If they're just very, if their Christianity is very, you know, because you're going to. You know, they say everyone's got a God-shaped hole. I, I don't. I never liked that. I always thought it sounded kind of. Mm. But men will put pl- thing. But I, I would put it more like this: that men will put things in the place of God. They will. Meaning. I have a God. Someone who doesn't have a God has other things, occupying that mental space. And often it takes the form of some sort of political ideology or some moral philosophy. It may not be a god, but it's functionally a god or it's functionally religion. It, it, because there is no... Because while you may, go, you may try to tackle you know, morality rationally, so much of it has nothing to do with... Ra- you can't just rationally, logically arrive at that conclusion. And so it's not a rational pursuit. It's something pursuing something that's not... You know, and that's not material. But, tr- you know, but, but again, idolatry is a form of, a form of trying to make the non-material material. Trying to take the image of the invisible and perfect God and trying to condense it down into something I can look at and say, this is it, right here. You know, I've gotten God down to a little tiny man who says exactly the things I need to understand. His heart is divided. It's, now they shall be found faulty. I can pick them apart. That's another good example of the idea of judgment and division. Pick apart. All right? Pick apart. Divide. See how they're connected? See again? You may think his heart is, oh, I'm a, yeah, maybe. That's not, but the idea of a divided heart in terms of being torn between two decisions and not being certain which way you want to go, the uncertainty that that idiom brings to us in English, I do not think is intended here. It is. It means his heart is picked apart, and now they are found faulty. And he will break down their altars and spoil their images. Ultimately, the thing we rely on these things for our safety, for our sense of well-being. You know what I mean? Like, I, I rely on God for many things. You know, it's like he gives me stability and security in the face of danger, in the face of trials, in the face of trouble, in the face of difficulty. And other people have other things that give them their security in those places. People say you can't have it without God. Without God, you can have all kinds of morality. It's just you have the morality of another God. there There is a dominant morality arising in the land. Things that used to be easy to speak against will become more difficult. You know? 
in some ways it's not worth it because it's like you know like like I said with the um, with the issue of certain sexual perversions it's the the, the cost benefit of going after that at the current in the current climate is especially because it's like it's one thing when you go off after you know Sodom and Gomorrah let's say was a very extreme example of it's not about you know the homosexuality because Gibeah was the same thing it wasn't it was the wickedness of that you know there's no one who would disagree that that was extremely immoral and wicked of the men of Sodom to do to some strangers enter into your city and you intend to rape them male or female it doesn't matter that is exceedingly wicked right it's one thing if you're talking about incidences such as that and saying here we have a, an example of wickedness we haven't come to the Sodom and Gomorrah level Though on a certain level, again, Ezekiel talks about Sodom and he says, the sins of Sodom, here's the sins of Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. And every abomination was found in her. I mean, that's what brings about the abominations. It's the, it's, it have, we are full of pride, we are full of bread, we have way too much idleness. And yeah, and that leads to we got a lot of time, we got a lot of pleasure, we got a lot of ease. And men start saying, you know, well, how, how can I pleasure myself? How can I, you know, I should strip off all my clothes and do things I shouldn't, that were morally unacceptable a generation ago. You know, it's, it's, it's the product of decadence and idleness. That they have the luxury to, to focus on something other than perpetuating the nation and surviving for now they shall say we have no king and what was my point in saying that well just that you know like going after the least versions of those sins now you're just you know like uh, you're going after somebody's cousin or brother who is just they just have some you know they they've just gotten married, quote unquote, and and what are you doing? All you're doing is taking people who are just doing their own thing. It's maybe morally unacceptable to you and to me, but it's not. They're not harming anybody. Are so. That's how it seems at the micro level. When you get close up, you think like, hey, what's this big deal? It's their thing. They, Never mind that the, that it's the way it poisons everything. You know what I mean? What's it got to do with you? Oh, I don't know. I have to hear about it. I've got to observe it. The examples are set to poison the minds of the next generation. And it is poison. No doubt about that. <laughs> if we all go down that road... There won't be another generation. And I don't mean just. I don't. And I'm. I'm not talking specifically about the the, the you know the homosexual issue. I'm talking about all kinds of sexual immorality. You know I mean, people they. I know lots of heterosexual people that never had any children, but had many many partners. You know what I mean. There won't be another generation if they keep it up. I mean, there will, but, but what I'm saying is that, you know, eventually we'll become so weakened and corrupt we will be destroyed. Just like they were. Just like Israel. For now they shall say, We have no king, because we fear not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? That verse is confusing to me. Let us see. Whenever I get a verse that in the King James seems a bit weird, and I'm sure it's translated fine, but they may not have gotten the sense just right. Let's consult another translation. If you're King James only, 
you may want to go to the bathroom or close your eyes or I don't I don't know what what did I do wrong here okay and that looks weird but there we go so which version should we which version should we consult the NIV the New Living Translation the ESV English Standard Version the Berean Study Bible I, I'm cheating on that one because I didn't know what that was NASB NAS New American Standard New King James King James CSB what are the Christian Standard Bible I never heard of that either well I'm gonna go with the Devil's Translation the NIV Because if I need it, if I if I want someone to summarize it and and not just translate it for me, there you go. <laughs> then it's the NIV. So here they say they will say we have no king because we do not remember the Lord. But even if we had a king, what could he do for us? Okay, I want to now. Let's see what the. Uh, Obviously, they're adding. No, let's try New American Standard. I don't remember if that. I forget what my favorite one is. As for the king, what can he do for us? Yeah, that's. Don't want that page. Okay. Well, let's see what it says. Just one more as long as we're here. What are we looking at? New American Standard? How about the... Where, where's the RSV? Oh, well, I never heard about that. The Scriptures. Uh, ISR, CSB. What's the New King James? I almost never look at that one. I've never liked the New King James because I'm like... It's not New King James. Similar, so... Let's go back to the King James Version. So strong, just to have it ready. All right, so... <clears throat> what was I thinking of right there? I was going to say something about the translations or something. I don't know. So, even if we had a king, or... Let's see. Well, what then? I guess that's where they get the idea of even. It doesn't matter, even. I mean, they, they lost their kingdom because they feared not the Lord, because of their, because the Lord punished them, because they abandoned him for idols. He takes away their idols, and he takes away their king. And I, well, I, here we go. Maybe this is a moment of truth. I, I don't know why I'm having, I was having trouble wrapping my mind around, but of course, it's very simple. If we fear not the Lord, what good is a king? Because if we fear not the Lord, the king will be taken away. We can lose our king if we fear not the Lord. So what good is a king, ultimately? That's the whole point. Originally, before there was a king, God was their king. But they didn't like that. They wanted a man to be king over them. Like the nations round about them. They wanted a king they could see. Just like idols are gods you can see. You can lay your hands on them. You can control. But you know, having a god you control. Or a man or a leader you can see. Has other disadvantages. They're. By the degree to which they are more, you know, tangible, they're also less powerful. You know what I mean? An idol is not as powerful as the invisible God. Because it's condensed down into some minimalist, you know, here's uh, this guy and he's God of the harvest. And he, you know, let's make sense, you know, and he's got his abilities and whatever. The degree they become more tangible, they also become less effectual. Like a king, like government can do so much for you, but God can do so much more. When God is your ruler, you have a much more effectual and 
able leader in your life than you would with a king. They have spoken words swearing falsely and making a covenant. Thus, judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. Judgment, hemlock like weeds. Hemlock is obviously a poisonous weed. You don't want hemlock in your fields, right? You, it's just like weeds. I mean, I have a garden. I weed it. You don't want the weeds to take over. They will if you allow them. <coughs> they have spoken words swearing falsely and making a covenant. What's the... Which commandment is that? The, the, the third? Fourth? I forget the order. Sorry. Thou shalt, you know, the, the, the commandment, the first commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy mind. Thou shalt not make any graven images. I think thou shalt not swear falsely. Or thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Yeah. Then, yeah, then uh, swearing falsely and keeping the Lord's Sabbath. Then comes kill adultery. No, then comes bear false witness. Boy, I used to have that memorized. The exact well, there's two versions of the Ten Commandments. This is a, you may think how embarrassing. He doesn't even know the Ten Commandments. It's like I purposefully reject the Ten Commandments as a, a standard of morality. So it wouldn't be surprising if each individual thing slipped my mind. I can come up with 10 commandments. I can come up with 50 commandments. I know a lot more commandments than the 10. As far as Old Testament commandments. So that's not a, a, a big deal. But remembering the exact order. Commit, kill, commit adultery. Swear falsely. Take the name of the Lord that got in vain. I forget if swear falsely is one of the first five. No, it is one of the second five. Because honor your father and your mother is one of the first five. There, That's the one I was missing. So worship the Lord. No idols. Keep the Sabbath day. Uh, honor your father and your mother. And I, See, again, I, I had it a minute ago, but now I forgot what it was. The one that fits in there. Take the name of the Lord. God. I said that. No. Take the name of the Lord God. Oh, keep the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Those are the first five. Okay. I, I know them all. See? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's stuff. And that's where it gets confusing because it's like, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's stuff or thou shalt not cover, covet his wife or his... Well, there's one where they roll that all together and there's one where they... Separate it all apart. I shall not bear false witness. I shall not covet thy neighbor's ox, his manservant, his maidservant, his land. What was the last one? Oh well, there we go. I I, I still prove myself ineffectual and def and defective. Oh, thou shalt not steal. There we go. That was the missing one. Thou shalt not steal. There, I got all ten. But you wonder, you know, I've been doing this for years. I know all ten commandments, right? I, I Like, I needed to be told, thou shalt not steal, to know that it was wrong. Like, oh, you got to be able to, what's the ten, what are the ten big ones? They're not my big ten ones. You know what I mean? Like, that's not the stuff I'm worried about from day to day, man. I'm more concerned with what Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount, as far as righteousness goes. Because I kill... I can look at the Ten Commandments and say, I there we go, see? I'm all right. Everything's Every duck's in a row. You know? But I look at the things Jesus said, and I said, boy, i got to watch myself. All right. So they swore falsely making a covenant before judgment comes. Because God hates that. 
false witness, false lying witness is an about a lying tongue is an abomination to the Lord. You know, people always they go out on the streets, they wear, carry placards, and they'll talk about sexual abominations and great whatever. But I hope you you know are mindful of the abominations that are in your mouth. The inhabitants of Samaria, I don't think I gotta say a lot about that, you know. By our false we false witness, it's like then the judgment comes against us. Bad things happen. Lies bring bad things. You know, sometimes you get away with it and you think like, well that's effectual, you know? Did you take my blah blah blah? No. You know, as a kid you may lie. And you find it solves your problems. Right? It instantly makes the trouble go away. But uh, it's so much more, you know, dangerous as you get older. And also, it just, it you run the risk of poisoning your life and everything around you. Nobody trusts you. People you need to trust you don't trust you. And then, where, where are you? untrustworthy you know and then uh, how do you fix that you know it puts you at a disadvantage in everything no surprise the weeds start popping up the inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Beth Aven Beth Aven being that name of Bethel a prophetic name given to it by the prophets Instead of Bethel, the house of God, it means Beth the house of, uh, well, I think I say vanity, but it actually means like destruction or, you know, not of God. It, whatever you think of as the opposite of God. For the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priests thereof shall, that rejoiced on it, for the glory thereof, because it is departed from it. They, again, the kings of Israel had set up golden calves, beginning with the first king of Israel when the kingdom was divided. They set up golden calves to be worshipped by the people and instead of going up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord because they feared their hearts would be turned back to the kings, to the sons of David. And so they set up a golden calf in Bethel, or calves here, or whatever, there's a matching pair. There's another one in uh, Dan. I think it was Dan, whatever. But, um, you know, there might be replicas all over the place. You know, they started off with one in Bethel and one in Dan. Or Bethel and... It's not Samaria. But anyways, they start off with a golden calf here, golden calf there. Pretty soon, we got idols under every green tree and on every high hill. And when they see the glory depart, you know what I mean? The golden calves were exalted, rejoiced over. You know, the priests rejoiced on it. Jumped up on the, gold, the altar of the golden calf and danced around. And, whoa, isn't this great? The golden calf that delivered us out of the land of Egypt, Israel. When they see it broken down, then they'll fear. When they see it smashed to pieces and the glory brought down to the dust, they will fear. They will mourn. It's taken away. It shall also be carried into Assyria for a present to King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be shamed of his own counsel. A Jerob, I think, is a symbolic name. I wonder if they translated that as a proper name, because I don't believe there was a technically a Jerob, king of Assyria. But because some people say, some people assume, like if it says that, it's like say, well, the Bible's not accurate. There never was a king Jerob, and you know, but it's like. It's like saying here, you know, there was never a president orange man. 
But we got all these records of people saying orange man bad. There never was an orange man president. The president at that time was Trump. What's all this orange man talk? What I'm saying is, they say the king of Assyria, uh, that old battle axe, and then people a thousand years later are reading it and saying, this isn't accurate. His name wasn't that old battle axe. I mean, there's a there's a bit of that in scholarship because they're thin minded. I mean, they, they don't have the breadth of intellect to consider what kind of writing they're reading is not a historical. It's a document from history, but it's not written as like Herodotus, who was like, these are the. History, you know, I mean, like maybe you look at the kings of Israel and Judah, perhaps the the chronicles and the the books of kings, but even that stuff is kind of prophetic in its nature. It wasn't written with the mind of like, oh, we need to have this. This needs to be accurate so it can be compared with historic records. As far as like, I said like someone's name, like calling him King Jared. Well, his name was Sennacherib. They kind of rhyme. I don't know. Maybe that has something to do with it. Uh, yeah, the name means let him contend. Right? The contender. He that contends. And I... And I you know, and, and if you when I look at the definition, it says the name of an Assyrian king. I'm not sure that's right. I'm not sure any Assyrian, Assyrian king was ever named Jerob. You know what I mean? And so the name may be given it is a name given by the prophet to the king of Assyria. That's just I'm just throwing that out there because if you go into deeper, because again, like I said, I don't give a deeper. I don't want to call it deeper. I don't do that kind of study where I'm going to go into a lot of detail about every, I will give the historical background, but I'm not going to go into the historical detail because I think that's kind of boring and it's not very useful. But if you do get into deep study, like at some point in someone's future, they go to Bible school or they, or they try to take a Bible course at a secular university you know, someone could say, like, well, you know, the book of Hosea, for example, is inaccurate. It talks about a King Jerob. There's no such person in history. Yeah. It's like, there was no King Stinky Pants. Why is this guy talking about King Stinky Pants? Never heard of such a thing. There's no records in the Assyrian inscriptions about their king being called Stinky Pants. Why would... <laughs> you know, like, I went to the Assyrian inscriptions, and I wanted to see if... The um, the nicknames their enemies gave them made it into their inscriptions. Yeah, not likely. Maybe they, you know, like let's say the Hebrew prophet calls him King Jerob. He's a contender. Maybe he doesn't like that. You know, maybe it's annoying. It's not like they call me King Jerob down there. Put that on my steel. I mean, like, the, the the relief. Put that on the wall, please. It's not the kind of thing that the, is necessarily widely recorded. Okay, how did I skip? How far ahead did I skip? Oh, I did. Yeah. Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. Ephraim and Israel again, same thing, just using two different names. It's like saying, it's like saying, Paul shall receive shame, and Mr. Stringini shall be ashamed of his own counsel. That's all it is. So they took some count. What count? You know, no evil shall come upon us. We will make friends with the Assyrians. They will be our ally, and they will. In fact, they will restore the glory of our kingdom by being allies with someone so powerful. They'll surely want to see us powerful also so that we can be strong together. 
They wanted to reign off of themselves. They saw their power in themselves as being enough. Got one minute, but I can explain this verse in less than that time. We'll just go up to verse 7. As for Samaria, her king is cut off as the foam upon the water. You know, that's not very hard, right? Foam on the water is not very resilient. The, 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 just, the water foams and the bubbles pop. You know? Like the popping of a bubble. He's cut off. Gone. Right. So we'll begin tomorrow with verse 8. Thanks for joining me in this study. Yeah, we're, we're right at an hour. We'll finish up right at an hour. Start with verse 8 tomorrow. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to uh, having that study tomorrow. Take heed that you do not your alms before men. To be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have.